Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We're going to move on. We're going to uh, look at verse 7 this morning. I think I mentioned last Sunday morning there were four particular issues that I want to look at here in this particular passage, verses 6 and 7. Uh, obviously, number one in verse 6, we learned something about being the called of Jesus Christ. We're going to look at what it means to be the beloved of God. We're going to look at this morning specifically what it means to be called saints. And then also Paul says something about grace and peace. And again, if you think, my goodness, why are we dwelling and, and looking at these verses uh, in, in greater detail, again, at the outset, at the beginning of our study in the book of Romans, I think it is very important to sort of take our time and uh, uh, look at these very important first truth principles uh, so that as we continue on in the edification process, we'll have an understanding, okay? So we are moving a little bit slowly at the beginning. However, we will begin to pick things up as we get towards the end of chapter 1 and so on and so forth, all right? So the passage for this morning, uh, let's read verses 6 and 7, Romans chapter 1, verse 6. Among whom ye are also call, the called of Jesus Christ to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you, and priests from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Last Sunday morning, we looked at verse 6, where we read that uh, the Romans are the called of Jesus Christ. Now, keep in mind, we too... Uh, as believers, we are now ca the called of Jesus Christ. It doesn't say we are called by Jesus Christ. And there is a, a distinction to be made. To be the called of Jesus Christ simply means that we are called to belong to him. God, uh, again, we're, we're just going to reject and we are going to ignore what the theological systems out there would say about being the call, that somehow God in eternity past predetermined that select individuals will receive this call onto eternal life. This is not what the passage is talking about. God did not single out individuals to call them onto eternal life. I, I hope we saw some passages where God calls all men. I mean, God will have how many men to be saved? All men. How many men does God not desire to, pass, uh, to perish? All men. So, uh, using a rough illustration, you know, the telemarketer, if you will, God calls all men to a saving knowledge and understanding of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the accomplishments of the cross of Calvary, is an every man achievement. It's available to everybody. But does that mean everybody will respond positively to that call? No. But, but God isn't some monster who has determined, well, only you are going to respond and you're not going to respond. No, it's out there and everyone has the opportunity to say yes or to say no. For those who say yes, they now are the called of Jesus Christ. You belong to him and now you are eternal participants in God's intelligent eternal purpose, okay? So the cult of Jesus Christ is not, you know, God has singled you out to hear this message onto eternal life, okay? So let's make that very, very clear. Um, and, and enough said, I hope, enough said. Well, verse 7 as Paul begins to elaborate just a little bit, we're going to learn something about being the call, uh, being called as saints. Now, verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, and we'll say some things about what that means, okay? Beloved of God, now notice, called to be, and here we go, what? Saints. Now, what does that mean? Called to be saints. Paul uses that word saints 38 times, okay? And uh, the dictionary definition, it comes from this word, this Greek word, uh, hagios, okay? Hagios. Now, we're not going to learn Greek. We don't need to study Greek, okay? 
The reason we want to point this out is that root word hagios is found in other words. Uh, for example, holy, the word sanctify, the word sanctification, the word hallowed. You know, uh, remember the uh, apostolic prayer, right? Uh, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You see that word, that, that, that has as that root word, hagios, which means uh, whether holy, sanctified, uh, sanctification, hallow, saint. To be a saint means we're the sanctified ones, okay? So the generic definition or that dictionary definition uh, has to do with uh, this, this hagios, which is uh, being holy, being sanctified, being uh, going through sanctification, being hallowed, okay? Now, uh, what we're going to find out here is to be a saint is a reference to who you are. Now, that's we got to, let's establish that. It's who you are. Last Sunday morning, we talked briefly about the difference between our position and our practice, our standing and our state. And we have to make this fundamental distinction between who we are positionally in Christ Jesus. Who we are is, is uh, uh, what God has made us, okay? And what God has made us in our standing, in our position, it is settled. It is fixed. It is unmovable. It is unchangeable. Who you are can never be any better or any worse, based upon our behavior, actions, attitudes, and so on and so forth. Now that's who we are in, uh, positionally. L let's take uh, water. Water. Water by nature, in its essence, in its, what it is, its makeup, is always water. Can you change the behavior of water? Yeah. Yeah. Water could be frozen, it could be a liquid, it can be a vapor, right? Can you change the flavor of water? Now, water doesn't have flavor, but can you flavor water? Yes. You can make it sour, you can make it sweet. Can you change the color of water? Yes. But you're always water, or water is always water, right? You can't make it any more wet. To be a saint, you are the forever sancti sanctified ones of Almighty God. You are a forever saint of Almighty God. Again, it is a fixed positional reality. Now, can a saint not behave like a saint? Listen, a saint uh, can't be any less of a saint than water can be any less water just because its behavior is different. Y you see the analogy there? Water is water. Now, water might behave differently. Water might uh, uh, taste different. Water might look different. Listen, a saint is a saint. Can a saint sometimes not behave like a saint? And we're going to see that. That's going to be dealt with in chapter 6, 7, and 8 especially. So ultimately, when we talk about being a saint, the theological idea of being a saint has to do with someone who lives a consecrated life. Oh, wait a minute. Are we called upon to live a consecrated life? Are we called upon to live a holy life? Uh, yeah. However, that's not what verse 7 is talking about. You are a saint in who? Christ. Because we're the called of Jesus Christ. We belong to Him. And, and we have to understand that our standing, our position, has been gained by someone else. Jesus Christ. Thank God is right. So, when we talk about being a saint, we're not talking about living a life right now. We're not talking about living a life that merits sainthood. Now you have this religious idea of being a saint. And you know what the religious idea is, right? Well, you know, there's a whole... Pro uh, you're a saint by board decision. You're a saint by committee. 
You're a saint because there's a bunch of, again, I mentioned it, a bunch of old men dressed in funny costumes wearing hats, and then they go through this process of beatification and then canonization, and then they recognize that one is now a saint based upon meritorious living. You know, we had Paul Stathis's aunt passed away, uh, 97 years old, home in glory, right? And so we had uh, some, you know, it was Monday morning, and in, you know, we're kind of waiting in, in the parlor that uh, his aunt is, uh, you know, there in the casket. Well, right next door in the adjacent parlor, there was a Greek Orthodox funeral taking place. I've never been to a Greek Orthodox funeral. And uh, talk about wearing a costume. You know, the, the, this, this priest, he, he had the costume on. Am I, be, am I being disrespectful? Yeah, I guess I am. I apologize. But. So, you know, he's got, the, he's got the, 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 the garments, the vestments, right? It's called vestments, okay? And I'm not just picking on Greek Orthodox. It could be Russian Orthodox. It could be, you know, uh, Roman Catholic and all that. Well, okay, so he's wearing the garb, okay? And on one arm, uh, you didn't see it, uh, well, on one arm, remember what the funeral director brought in? He has a picture of Jesus raising Lazarus up from the dead. On the other arm, he has this uh, shroud kind of a thing. And then they do have this uh, incense. And, you know, he's there and, uh, uh, up and down, chanting, praying, blah, 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 blah. And, and, you know, the religious system, they, you know, they go through all of this activity and all of this performance. And wait a minute. Being on, and I guess at the end of the funeral, what the priest does is he takes oil and dirt and then does the sign of the cross all over the, the body. You know, I mean, all of this activity. Okay, listen, the religious system might tell you who a saint is and who a saint is not. But we don't care about religion, do you? Religion complicates life. Religion, uh, you know, Jesus Christ had some unkind things to say about religion, okay? Now, if you're ma angry at me because... I describe some of these guys wearing funny-looking costumes, and you're, you're offended. Just read what the Lord Jesus has to say about those same types. You know, Jesus said something about those that wear the long robes. And, they, and you know what they do? They deliberately make themselves look, you know, worn and weary and battered. You know, all a white sepulcher. Jesus Christ says, you guys are just a bunch of white sepulchers. You're making people a two-fold child of hell. And now, is that offensive? So, I, 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 please, my, my goal is not to offend the religious system. My goal is to expose the religious system for what it is. And you know why I'm, I'm worked up? How dare you take a truth regarding being a saint and demean it and devalue it by saying, well, you've got to qualify to be a saint. Listen. If you're in Christ Jesus. Now, last Sunday, and, and I, you know what? I was sort of, remember I said something like, uh, did, 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 the, did the Corinthians deserve to be called saints? And man, did I see you people hesitate. Now, I'm going to ask it again. Do the Corinthian, the, the, the believers, mind you, okay. Did the Corinth, do the Corinthians deserve, are they entitled to be called saints of Almighty God? Yes! Now, were they a bunch of carnal babes engaged in gross immorality? But did they deserve to be called saints? Why? They're in Christ. Faithful is He who calleth you. Please. Now, did they live out? Did they live within their identity as a saint? No. Hence, Paul's got to write two letters. But they are saints by another, by Jesus Christ. See, grace, and we're going to have to clarify grace. I know the knee-jerk in instinct is, but look at how they're living. They're not saints. Yeah, they are saints. And our practical living begins in a person. It begins in who we are in Christ. So please, uh, I understand. And, and listen, the Corinthians deserve to be saints, to be called saints, because they're in Christ. And Paul even begins that letter by, by actually establishing that truth, all right? We'll say uh, some more things about that. So the, the generic definition, 
To be a saint means that one is, is sacred. Now, I want you to appreciate this. One. You know, you are sacred to Almighty God. You are consecrated. It carries with it the idea of being pure, of being clean, of being washed, of being sterilized. In fact, let's see how the word is used. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In the Bible, uh, you've heard it before. The Bible is its own best dictionary, isn't it? So if you want to grasp the concept of being a saint or of being holy, and I know that's a tough one, you know. You people are holy. Don't allow religion to skew and to distort what it means to be holy. But in Christ, you are holy. And uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 is a great illustration of the way that word is used. For example, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. We're not even going to, now listen, does this mean an unbeliever goes to heaven because they marry a believer? We, being sanctified can mean a lot of different things, all right? And, and the rudimentary definition for sanctification or being, it means that, yeah, God has set something or someone apart. That's the one side of sanctification or sainthood. When God separates you from something, but what's the flip side? It's separated onto God's own personal, private, intelligent, eternal purpose. There's a twofold aspect to being a saint or being sanctified. God takes us, he removes us, he separates us, he sets something or someone apart, and now it belongs to him. So, the idea of being sanctified, uh, I, I, we're not going to, why does Paul say what he says, okay? And, and there's a lot of confusion about verse 14. We're not going to deal with what Paul's dealing with here in verse 14. Let's appreciate the word usage. Verse 14 again, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Now notice, else were your children unclean, but now are they what? You see how the word sanctified, then you have the word holy, and then you have that word unclean. So, so we begin to have a feel for well, what, what does it mean to be a saint? Again, the, the root word being sanctified, consecrated, sacred. It's, it simply means you're set apart, but set apart onto something. There is this process of spiritual sterilization this idea of being unclean and yet now because outside of christ we're unclean we're corrupted we're polluted we're tainted but in christ we're garbage in fact that is the language we're going to find in romans chapter 3 when god says that everybody's unprofitable you know that word unprofitable you ever gone to the market and you're looking for veggies or for fruit and then all of a sudden you see a particular, you know, orange that doesn't look very much like orange anymore, but it's a lot of white and green. You know, that, what do you do with a moldy orange? That's the idea of being unprofitable. Waste, refuse, garbage. I love, you're right. You know, outside of Jesus Christ, we live in a sick sad, sorrowful world. We all, as sinners, are consigned to Satan. We're garbage. <laughs> Talk about offending people. God's estimation of an unbelieving human being, you're garbage. You're waste product. You're trash. I remember driving once in a while, uh, was it 294? What, you, you know, there's that garbage dump there off of 294 and uh, uh, Eisenhower, what is it, 290? You know? And you, you ever drive past a garbage dump? Oh, you know, that nauseating, you know. Or, or roadkill in August when it's 110 degrees out. 
In Pennsylvania, there's a deer. Uh, you know that stench, the smell of death. You know what God's estimation of the unbeliever is? You're garbage. And yet God commended his love toward us in that while we were garbage, waste, refuse. Only God can see the eternal potential in garbage. God uses the foolish things, doesn't he? Aren't you glad? Aren't you God glad isn't looking for the gold? God says, I'm going to show you how gracious I am. I'm going to traverse the garbage dump of the universe called planet Earth. And not only am I going to visit this garbage dump, I'm going to become one of them. Jesus Christ came into the world. He's the Lord from heaven, and he took upon him a body of flesh. And can you imagine God Almighty walking through? You ever seen pictures of that garbage dump in Guatemala? You got people living in a garbage dump. Your, their backyard, it, it, can you imagine living in a garbage dump? Guess what Jesus did for 33 years of his life? Hey, he became our neighbor. You know what? Do you, view the, do you view this world as a garbage dump? You know, when Paul says, set your affection on things above, right? You know, don't, don't see the value. This, this world is a garbage dump. Man, where do we belong? Our, our conversation is where? In heaven. This is a garbage. And God's not. God one day is going to transform this garbage dump into a polished, shining gem. In the universe, but he hasn't done it quite yet. So in the meantime, Jesus Christ, he took on that physical body of flesh. He was begotten of God. And you know what? He became a neighbor with garbage. What love is this? What love is that? You know, only God can say, I love you. Did he improve the human condition? He did something far better than that. I'm going to give you eternal life. And I'm going to give you so, I'm going to give you by my sheer grace. You see how grace is measured? It isn't an act of grace to take gold and to build a structure. It's God who can take garbage and say, "I'm going to create a brand new dwelling place." I mean, uh, listen, we are garbage. God he can take that garbage, separate it, and only God through his sanctifying capacity can sterilize it, wash it, clean it, and now say, it is my peculiar personal prop prop uh, property. I have consecrated it. I have made it sacred to me, holy. Now, it has nothing to do with what you ever achieved in your life. It has absolutely nothing to do with what you can do. It does not come by way of praying and by going to church and by doing good things and living a good life. It comes through a person, Jesus Christ. That's why are you the called of him, you see. And if you're the called of him, guess what? You are the called of Jesus Christ. The Bible talks about a holy city. What city does the Bible call the holy city? Go, go to Exodus chapter 3. Jerusalem is a holy city. Is it a holy city? <laughs> Not now. <laughs> Not now. And quite honestly, was it ever a holy city? Well, what do we mean by holy? Uh, Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> Here in Exodus chapter 3. Look there at verse 5. Exodus 3, verse 5, God talked to Moses, and he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is what kind of ground? Now, was Moses walking on a patch of solid gold? Wait a minute, what makes the soil on Mount Sinai in the desert more holy than the dirt in the valley? Chemically analyzed, dirt is what? 
So what does it mean when God says, you know that, but the ground, Moses, you're that, you're, it's holy ground. You know what God's saying? I have set this patch of dirt aside for my own personal, eternal purposes. Okay, see that? The concept of being holy. Um, go to Exodus chapter um, 16. Exodus chapter 16. In fact, this is a great, again, Bible usage. We're going to define words. Go to Exodus 16 and then Genesis chapter 2. Uh, Exodus 16. I, I want to press and stress as firmly and as strongly as I can. If you're in Christ, you are a saint. And I don't care what the religious system or the theological system of this world will try to make of it when God tells us that you are personally sacred to him. I hope that encourages you. And man, you're not garbage anymore. Uh, thank God. You might walk like you're garbage. <laughs> don't get me wrong. You might have, but positionally in Christ, you're not garbage anymore. Exodus chapter 16, verse 23. Exodus 16, verse 23. And he said unto them, this is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye bake today, and see that which ye will see, and that which remaineth over lay up for you to be kept until the morning. Now, the Sabbath, of course, was the, what day of the week was the Sabbath? And God says, he always calls it holy. Of the seven days of the week, there is a holy day. Go to Genesis chapter 2, the holy Sabbath, Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day... God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day, and what's that word? Sanctify. Again, that idea. Saint. It's the root, the idea, not in the Greek, obviously, uh, but the Hebrew, by the way, is no different. In the Hebrew, the word holy, sanctified, saint, same thing. When God says this is a holy day, he sanctified it. Again, verse 7, he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because uh, that in it he had rested from all, from all the work which God created and made. So you, you have uh, not only ground that is called holy. You, you've got a day of the week that is called holy because God says, I sanctified it. I set that day apart for a particular purpose and for a reason. Okay, so we have, you see how we're sanctified Holy, so on, so you, there's there are holy angels. What does that imply? There are some angels that aren't. There are holy prophets, on and on. Now, if you think that a saint is one who has earned the title via consecrated life, go to Psalms chapter 106. Psalms chapter 106. And you know what? Keep your finger there in Exodus. Too late, right? Go back. We're also going to go to Exodus 32. Exodus chapter 32, and then we're going to compare it with Psalms 106, okay? This, this passage will just obliterate the foolish notion and the heresy that a saint is one who has earned it. Look at, look at Psalms chapter 106, and uh, verses, oh, let's verse 16, okay? Psalms 106, verse 16. They envied Moses also in the camp, and Aaron, the, the what? The saint of the Lord. Aaron, the saint of the Lord. Is he called saint by committee? Is he officially recognized by a church? Aaron is called a what? He's a saint. All right, let's look at saint Aaron, Exodus chapter 32, uh, not Aaron, I think I saw Aaron, Aaron, no, that's Olga, okay, I don't know if St. Aaron is here, right, we do have a couple of St. Aaron's around here, uh, Exodus chapter 32, um, verse 1, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mountain, the people gathered themselves together onto Aaron, now what do we know about him in Psalms, hey, that's St. Aaron, right, and said unto him, up, uh, Make us gods which will go before us. For as for this Moses, that the man that brought us up, 
by the way, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt? The man that brought us up? Wait a minute. Who brought Israel up out of the land of Egypt? My goodness. They walked through a corridor called the Red Sea. That's, that's man's problem, right? They're always looking at the human accomplishments from a human frame of reference. It was God Almighty. Uh, anyway, verse 2, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons. I guess you do have men wearing earrings, right? Um, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. Verse 3, And all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto their saint Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, This be thy gods, o, o Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Hey, Moses didn't do it, nor was it Jehovah God. Who did it? You see this image, this idol? Verse 5, And when Aaron, St. Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it and saint aaron made proclamation and said tomorrow it is a feast to who verse 21 drop down to verse 21 and moses said unto saint aaron now i'm adding saint i understand that but wait a minute psalms 106 called him what he's a saint of the lord all right what did moses say unto saint aaron what did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them. Verse 25, And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for St. Aaron had made them naked under their shame among their enemies. Verse 35, And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. Oh my goodness. Can a saint mess up? Did St. Aaron mess up? You see, but Aaron, is just, it has nothing to do with his behavior. It has to do with what God did by separating him. Okay? So, wow. Now you understand why the Corinthians deserve to be called saints? Not because of their behavior actions or lack thereof but because they're in Jesus Christ. Never be ashamed by saying the Corinthians were the saints of Almighty God. Now, they needed to learn about what the ramifications are. Aaron, he's going to learn the hard way. Okay? He's going to learn the hard way. But he's still a saint. Critically important. Go back to Romans Seven, uh, 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 chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, and uh, let's look at verse 7 again. And now we're going to run some things, some verses. To be a saint, that's who you are. We're not into the practical section of Romans yet. So, so please, so far, this is what God is saying about the believer. has nothing to do with, look at how you're living, look at how you're not living. Let's look at who you are. Fundamental doctrine. Verse 7, to all, verse, Romans 1, 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be. Now, do you, you know what the word, or the, that's a name. Saint. That is a name. And we're going to see that in just a second. You know, the word name conveys a, a number of different things. You know, that's the name of the game. You, ever, you know, you, ever, you see the word name could be, that's the name, there was a song, that's the name of the game, right? Oh, he's just trying to make a name for himself. Uh, stop in the name of the what? That is, under the jurisdiction, under the authority, under the identity of something else. You see, to be a saint, that is a name title. You know what that says? You belong to somebody. It doesn't say, wow, you live a really good life. You live a consecrated life. To have the name saint is a that is your name it signifies you're somebody else's possession and that's a good thing man that is a very good thing the idea of the name go to first corinthians chapter one first corinthians chapter one 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> uh, we, we were here last Sunday. We're not going to rehash any of this. But look there at verse 2, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified. Remember how it was used there, Exodus, right? All, You're holy. You guys have been declared to be holy. Sanctified. Ah, here we go again. Where? In Christ, in Christ, in Christ, sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ. Now, wait a minute. Is Paul saying, oh, to everybody who prays to Jesus, you know, to everybody who, who literally, you know, verbally calls on the name of Jesus? What does it mean to call upon the name of Jesus? You're not talking about, uh, you know, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. You know, and, you know you got, uh, I was in a prayer meeting. Uh, you know, for, <laughs> it seemed like an hour, but, you know, for a minute, you know, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, sweet Jesus, 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 Jesus. You know, and I'm getting just sick and tired. You know, Jesus, you know what they're doing? They're calling on the name Jesus. Jesus. That's not what Paul's talking about. What does it mean to call upon the name? To call upon the identity, the jurisdiction, the authority. You see, only a consecrated one, one who has been separated by the miraculous power of Almighty God, placing us, taking us out of Adam and putting us into consecrated, sacred union with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are the ones who call upon the name we function and have our identity in a person the idea of the name it isn't jesus 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 this, or jesus that jesus this by the way unbelievers are always calling upon the name of jesus right jesus christ oh, you've heard that before right you know jesus christ well how many times have to tell you that you talk about using the lord's name in vain right jesus you're such an you know you, you heard that before right Listen, unbelievers call on the name of Jesus all the time. Is that, who God's, uh, is that who Paul's talking about? The church and all of those wretched pagans who are calling on the name of Jesus. Jesus this, Jesus that, you know? That's not what Paul's talking about. That name. It has to do with our identity. <clears throat> Go over to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. 2 Timothy 2, 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. <laughs> I, mean, I love this verse. Well, Hebrews talks about there are two immutable things. God said it, and God can never change his mind. So if God says, I'm going to seal this reality, right? This is our reality, by the way. Uh, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are what? Oh, I love that. I belong. Who do you belong to? I am his and he is mine. He knows who belongs to, to him, them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the Name of Christ, depart from iniquity. Yeah, you factory worker who got your finger stuck under that press and then you yell out, Jesus Christ. Oh, you better depart from iniquity. No, oh, you know who those that name Jesus Christ, it's the ones who hold to that title. That's our, that's our identity. We'd operate under his authority. We operate in the realm of his jurisdiction. Um, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 5. We got a name change. You know, when Sherry, not my wife's name, prior, when Sherry and I were dating, her name was Sherry Hogue. H-O-G-E. And you know what everybody called her, you know, Sherry Hogue, you know, or Hoagie or Hoggy or Sherry Hogue. You know what happened when we got married? Her, her name changed. She didn't have, well, you know, her, she now has adopted my last name, okay? Culturally, that happens, okay? So there's a name. You know what happens when God sanctified us? And, and he, he, in an instantaneous process of sainthood, he changed our names. 
Thank God. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And notice there in verse 3. Ephesians 5 verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as it become a saint. Huh. Let it not be named among you as it what? Become a saint. You know, there are some saints who are not walking properly. Understand? That's not, it's unbecoming. Now, you see, when Paul talks about let it not be once named, because that's not your name. You know what our name is? Saint. So when you write me, I want you to write Saint Alex. <laughs> You know, I go th past that St. Michael Cemetery, St. Alexis Hospital, you know. Now, I don't know if God, there, there were believers. I know why Alexis is called a saint by decree, by committee. You know, miraculous signs and blah, 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 blah. Uh, but wait a minute. I have a name. My name is a saint. And, and that is your name. In Christ, you're a saint. Why? Now, let's, real quick, Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. And um, th this idea of being consecrated. Romans chapter 14, verse 8. Romans chapter 14, verse 8. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lords, you see the concept of being a saint? God says, I'm taking you out of Adam. I'm taking you out of the garbage dump. Of the, I'm taking you out. And we'll see the verse. And God sterilizes us. He washes us. He cleanses us. He purifies us. And you are now mine. Wow. You know why nothing can separate you from the love of God? Who's going to take away something that belongs to God? Go ahead. Uh, by the way, there is a creature who does seek to do just that. Will he ever succeed? He tried to take away Jesus Christ, the beloved son, away from his loving father. Did he succeed? Even the son in despair. Oh, let, me, let not the pit Swallow me up. You know what the adversary is always seeking to do? Separate us from love of God. If he can't do it in position and in reality, he wants to do it in our thinking. He wants to convince us. No, you're such a horrible person. How in the world can you ever be a saint? And he tries to separate us in our thinking and in our practice. Listen, uh, this is such a comforting. But regardless, you die, you live. We are the Lord's. Uh, go to chapter, or I'm sorry, uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. We're His, man. We're His. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, <laughs> and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption. We have what? Redemption. You know what the word redeem means? You know, I was, you know, I'm getting old. I know. And I remember the S&H green stamps. Remember the S&H green stamps? My mom would have a pile of whatever this was. You know, and we had a pile of stamps, and then she'd come home with a little lamp. You know, like. You know, 10,000, that's a day, and you come home with a lamp. And then it broke, and, you know, and it breaks about a week later. And you would redeem something. You know what it means to be redeemed? I bought you. I bought you. You are my. That whole concept of redemption. God said, listen, we used to be the property of Satan. We were consigned to him as God. Dead in sins, and we were also dead how? In the uncircumcision of our flesh. You know what? We were part and parcel of the kingdom of our father, Satan, okay? And what does God say? I'm going to redeem. I'm going to buy you. 
I'm going to buy you. Here is a piece of garbage. The guy says, you know, how am I going to buy Jeff? I'm picking on you, not because I think you're garbage, but, you know, how am I going to manifest my love to, how am I going to buy you? You know what I'm going to, you know how I'm going to have to buy you? I'm going to have to kill my son who did no wrong, who did nothing but love, who, who, who created you, who, who received nothing but adoration, worship, love, intimacy, and all that. I'm going to have to take him, and I'm going to have to kill him. I'm going to have to sacrifice him so I can buy you out, out of the slave market of death. Boy, does God love you? What does he have to do to prove it? Uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. To be a saint means we're his. We're useful. We're his personal, private possession. And if we belong to him, he loves what he owns, okay? He loves what, his own, what he owns. You do remember when you were kids? Maybe you still do that. Maybe you, yeah, we still do that. You know, you know, the only difference between men and boys are the, their toys, right? You know, now it's, you know, whether it's a car or a boat. I remember the first time I bought my, my first pair of Converse All-Star sneakers. Remember those? Converse, everything. Light blue, colored shoes. And you know what I did for, I think, two weeks? I would take my shoes and I would put it on my desk, you know. I wouldn't even let it, I wouldn't put it on the floor. Those were my Converse All-Stars, you know. It's mine. And as soon as it got dirty, you know, I had to clean it up at night, you know. Now, I was young, you know, 24. No, I wouldn't care. <laughs> no, I was a lot younger than that. You know, a pair of gym shoes. But man, I would, I would wipe the, you know, hey, there was a little smudge on my dirt. You know, it was just a pair of stupid Converse shoes, you know. But it was mine. You know, somebody stepped on it. Time out. You know. We got to stop the game, guys. Why? Man, look at my shoe, you know. I mean, it's my personal possession. I value it. I ascribe worth to it. I can ascribe worth to a gym shoe. Now, you get older, we start ascribing worth to other things, right? And it doesn't have to be material things. You know, I mean, a whole lot of things. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. These verses say it best. Verse 19. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. What? I love those what's. Study the what's in Scripture. You, you know, whenever your kid does something, kind of, you think, what? What? You, you Corinthians, are you kidding me? What? No, ye not. Up. Oh, Paul just told you what the problem is. Lack of understanding, lack of ignorance. Now listen, you are a saint. That's your name title. And you know why sometimes we aren't behaving like it? It's usually out of ignorance, okay? And, and so the Corinthians are guilty of that. No, ye not, that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a what? Price? What price was that? The eternal son who experienced our eternal wrath. The one who was loved and adored experienced the hateful fury of God's vengeance experiencing the death of a wicked person. Man, that's a heavy price. It's a heavy price. That tells you how valuable you are. Ye are not your own. Verse 24, ye are bought with a price. Therefore, Glorify God in your body and in your spirits, which are what? They're God's. You know what makes Jerusalem holy? God says, that's my city. Moses, you know why that ground, that dirt, that mud, that sand is holy? That's my dirt. You know why those angels are holy? That's, those are my angels. You know why you're a saint? You're mine. We may not always reflect it. I understand that. But a glorious exchange and transfer took place. We used to be something. Go to, go to Acts 26. Let's run a few more verses. I, I, I'm going to throw these verses out at you. Hopefully it will stick between your eyes. And then you, 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 you just value your name. Rest in your name. Enjoy your name. 
And don't let the adversary and his trickery and his lies convince you, oh, you're not worthy of that name. You are worthy of it. Because look at what Jesus did. The Lord Jesus Christ, okay? We haven't even gotten into practice, have we? You know, Paul does not even going to deal with it for another few chapters. But all Paul is doing is saying, this is who you are. This is what you have. This is what you, you, you become. Let's enjoy that. And then, you know, give it five chapters. And then when we get to chapter six, hey, we're going to learn something about the manifestation of that name title, that identity. You want to name Jesus? You want to name the name of Jesus Christ? Okay, this is how it's going to look. But we're not there yet, okay? We're just learning who we are. Isn't that kind of like a baby? You know who you are, little baby? You're ours. And what do we do with little babies? Listen, when Alex came home, you know, I just said, all right, Al, can't wait. All right, we're going to get up every morning at such and such time. We're going to run, you know, calisthenics, and, and we're going to start working on algebra. You understand that a baby needs to be loved, adored, valued. You know a baby knows when it's not loved? You know, they, you know when, 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 when a mother or a father impatiently, you know, I can't, I, they put them down, they walk away. You know, babies aren't stupid. All a baby knows, all it needs, it's, it's to me, it needs to be coddled, cradled, cared for. That's all you ever do. That's all a mother does. Don't ever fault a mother. All you ever do, you know, hug it. You ever, don't you love, I just, mother, how, mothers will always kiss their, their baby. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a weird looking kid, but okay. And, you know, and, and man, they, they, they just, all, they, all you want to do is, the outpouring of effect. You know what all God wants to do in the opening verses of the book of Romans? He wants this outpouring of his affection and devotion and love. Let him love you. I heard a preacher out there, Paul Parisi, you know, he was telling me how this guy, he got saved. He came out of a religious system. He said, I got, he got saved. And he goes up to Pastor Paul and he says, what do, you, what do you want me to do? You know what Paul said, Pastor Paul? He said, Nothing. I just want the Lord to love you. I want you to sit there for the next year and let the Lord love you. They say that some of the causes, that some, most mental health issues are caused because people don't think they're loved. And man, God wants us to just rest in the intense we haven't even talked about being beloved of god yet okay but but it has to do, we're beloved let god just cradle you and it's okay let him just kiss you you're my kid you know you're my baby you're mine you're mine you're mine you're mine you're mine, mine, mine and then we'll get to the edification process in just a little bit acts chapter 26 acts chapter 26 verse 18 Boy, you know what the religious system wants to do? It just wants to grind you. Just wants to grind you. Wants to, you see, it's bondage. That's why the law, it's bondage. It shackles you. It grinds you. It wears you out. It just keeps. And, and God says, I want to love you. And I want you to know I love you. And I want you to enjoy it. You can enjoy being loved. Sometimes we feel guilty. Sometimes we feel guilty enjoying the liberality. Don't ever be ashamed of that. We are in the forever family of Almighty God. We're going to find out to be being beloved of God. You know what the implications are of being the beloved of God? Listen, we are personally, organically attached to our Father. And first things first, He loves us with undying devotional. I'm going to say this now, and we'll, we'll ferret this out. God can't live without you. You know what it means to be beloved? He can't live without you. Now, what does our sin nature do? Can't live without me. When God says, you are beloved, I can't live without you. Can he exist without you? Yeah. Can he live and enjoy eternity? without us that's why he created humanity that's why he sacrificed his son and that's why he says i'm going to make a new species of a new creature 
He can't go on without us. He can't live without us. Can you imagine that? And we dismiss each other. God will never dismiss you. You are the joy of his heart. He can't get enough of you. Oh, he can be fed up with some of the things, but he can't get enough of you. Now, I, I just, man, is there a reason to be discouraged for the rest of the week? I, okay, go ahead. Take more taxes. Go ahead. Take it all. Take it all. But God can't live without me. You know, that was Paul's attitude. You can take it. Take everything. It doesn't matter. Because the world's got nothing I want anyway. You can't take it with you anyway. Best thing they ever did to the Apostle Paul is they cut his head off to be with Christ, which is far better. Listen, man, don't let the frame of reference that our culture has just stop it. We don't need to get all unglued and worked up and blah, 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 blah. You know, God can't live without me. <laughs> you think that might change the way we view our lives? And maybe we, begun, we begin to think, you know, as become its saints. Why am I living in the rot and in the cesspool and in the garbage dump? When God says, you see, that's where it all begins. Acts chapter 26. Acts 26, verse 18. Acts 26, verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are what? You see what you know what sanctification is? I've taken you away from him. I freed you from the power and the authority and the bondage. I've taken you out of the sheer ignorance and the blindness and in the darkness. And I put you in my son and you're mine. You're all mine. I'm going to seal it. And you're sanctified by how? Faith. Not by committee. Not by works. Not by decree. By faith. That invisible work of Almighty God where He transfers us, He exchanges us, that sanctum, that set up, there's that purification and the sterilization process. And it's by faith. Man, it's incredible what faith achieves. One more verse. Boy, time's flying. Go to chapter 20. Chapter 20. Chapter 20. Chapter 20. Verse 32. Chapter 20, verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to what? Now listen, in Romans 1, 7, you know where we're at in the edification process? We're, we're still way down there, foundation. But, but grace is going to build us up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are, and there's that word again, what? I am sanctified. I am consecrated. I am sacred. I am holy. Now we're going to stop. Nothing burns me up than when somebody says, oh, you know, that he's such a holy man. What do you mean he's a holy man? Listen, you're a holy person, David. You're, a, you're holy. You're holy. You're all in Christ. You're what? You're holy ground. You belong to God. Should I be careful in how I treat God's personal, eternal possession? Because when I sin against Jeff, I sin so against Christ. How dare you treat my son like that? Man, that's sobering stuff, right? Are you people saints? Aren't you happier, saint? And it's by faith? And you belong to the, the one who loves you with undying devotion do you deserve it but do you deserve it why you're in Christ father we thank you for your grace and love and goodness and what it is you've declared us to be and what it is you've made us to be eternally oh father may we as we just set our roots in this foundational reality call to be saints all we can say is thank you we thank you for in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.